Right, so I think of books and even religion and self-help as operating systems, but meditation, and specifically what I teach at Ziva, is defragging your brain computer. Mm -hmm. It is upgrading the nervous system that is your brain and body. And so once I found that, I didn't, I was not a seeker anymore. I was like, oh, I found it. Right. And it's right inside of me. Wow. The thing I'm looking for is inside I'm of no me. I'm no longer seeking. No. I have found it. Yeah. I am a finder. Yeah. And it has been found. Correct. And it is inside. Yes. And I can access it with two minutes, two twice a day, 15 minute sessions. Welcome to Plenty. I'm your host, Kate Northrup, and together we are going on a journey to help you have an incredible relationship with money, time, and energy and to have abundance on every possible level. Every week, we're gonna dive in with experts and insights to help you unlock a life of plenty. Let's go fill our cups. Please note that the opinions and perspectives of the guests on the Plenty podcast are not necessarily reflective of the opinions and perspectives of Kate Northrup or anyone who works within the Kate Northrup brand. Hello, welcome to Plenty. I'm so excited to introduce you to my guest today. Her name is Emily Fletcher. She is the best-selling author of Stress Less, Accomplish More, and she teaches high achievers like Navy SEALs, Olympians, Broadway actors, CEOs to stress less and achieve more, to actually meditate in order to optimize their lives and achievement. And we are also bringing in a really yummy conversation about how adding pleasure and our circuitry around life force can enhance that. Enjoy the episode. (laughs) That one felt great. Emily, you have taught high performers, household name Hollywood actors, incredible, like also household name holistic doctors, all kinds of folks. Olympians, maybe? Yeah. I just threw it in. But <laughs> yes. Navy C- SEALs. Navy SEALs. CEOs. Like Stay-at-home moms. How to finally let their bodies release the stress that they have been carrying around for generations. <laughs> okay. And I'm so excited to talk to you about it. I just read your book. And it is called Stress Less, Accomplish More. It's so, all, I know it's confusing because your book is very similar. Well, here's what happened. <laughs> so I know you know this story, but I'll just for like warm up. What happened is I was speaking at the Wanderlust, Vermont one, when Wanderlust used to be a thing. There was like yoga, whatever, wellness festivals. And it was uh, June, I think, of 2019. And they sent me the speaker lineup and the titles of the talks. And they had me, they had a workshop of mine called Do Less, Have More simultaneously scheduled next to Stress Less, Achieve More. Accomplish More. Uh, Accomplish More. And I emailed them and I was like, hi, so I'm so excited about that other workshop. I feel like um, I'm not sure who Emily Fletcher is. I'm sure she's great. I just think it's going to be confusing for participants to choose between (laughs) those two workshops, which at first glance seem identical. (laughs) And so they reorganized the programming. And then I never got to meet you, but there was this one quick moment. We were there with our toddler and my uh, one-year-old. You had a one-year-old also at the time because you gave birth in June 2018. Yep. I gave birth in April 2018. So our, our, our babies, our, yours is almost six. Mine turned six yesterday or two wow. years ago. And I remember we were like walking down the sidewalk with, you know, the baby, the toddler, like who even knows my boobs hanging out. And I saw you in the distance and I was like, this would be my moment to introduce myself to this woman. But I just like couldn't. <laughs> so anyway, that was my intro to you. And I was like, there she is. Stress less accomplished more. You know, it's so funny though, is it? I like breastfed my way through that book launch, have never been more stressed in my entire life. And I felt like such a sham, you know, I felt like such a fraud where you're just like, I am not practicing what I'm preaching. But in hindsight, I was like, you know what? This is a chapter of life. You don't give birth to a book and a baby at the same time that often in your life. Hope, God willing. God willing. But and I know a lot of people who do it. I don't know what that is. I think is the creativity portal the, opens. It is. It's the creativity portal. And then it's like, let's just put in two. <laughs> We're going to give you a book and a baby at the same time. So I'm so glad that we didn't meet then though. Me too. Because we, we met at the perfect time. And I love the way that our friendship has evolved. 
I love the fact that we're both Aries. I love that we're in this mastermind together. I love that the more I learn about your work, I'm like, oh wait, we're teaching the exact, the exact same thing. Same thing. <laughs> it's wild. Which makes sense why they shouldn't have scheduled our workshops <laughs> exact same time because literally same, same, but really different also. So yeah. I'm really excited to find out more about the origin story and also where things have come to now, five years later, almost six. Well, yeah, five years later, five years later, because we launched our baby books when our babies were one. So there you were on Broadway. And that's a dream of so many people's, including like myself, like in an alternate universe, like that would have been something that maybe I would have pursued. And you were miserable even though you were living your dream. Why do you think that was? Because I was more interested in the happiness of pursuit than I was the pursuit of happiness. Like I am happiest when I am moving towards a goal. I am happiest when I am using all of me to move towards something that I think is good for me or the planet. And I had been doing that since I was eight. You know, I was like, oh, once I get on Broadway, I'll be happy. Once I get on Broadway, it'll be martinis with Liza at Sardi's. And instead it was like girls eating tuna fish out of a can and complaining about their bunions. And I was like, this is not my dream. And so, but I just thought it was the next show and the next zero and the next boyfriend and the next agent. And I did that for 10 years. 10 years. But you know what? Like I just was listening to an interview this morning and it was with Rebel Wilson and she's like, I'm so glad that I achieved my dream of becoming a Hollywood, you know, famous Hollywood actress. She made $20 million in one year. She's like, but I'm so glad I did that so that I could realize that that was not the key to happiness. And I think it's the same for me. I achieved my Broadway dream at 22 years old. And it wasn't until I was about 30 that I was like, oh, another show's not going to do it. Like, I'm going to have to actually look inside. But how did you find that out? What got you off the crack? <laughs> Well, I used to pride myself on being a seeker. You know, like I was like, oh, new therapy, new book, like you name it, I had done it. If there was a new software program that could uplevel your consciousness, I was in. But it wasn't until I found meditation that I got the hardware upgrade, right? So I think of books and even religion and self-help as operating systems, but meditation and specifically what I teach at Ziva is defragging your brain computer. Mm -hmm. It is upgrading the nervous system that is your brain and body. And so once I found that, I didn't, I was not a seeker anymore. I was like, oh, I found it. Right. And it's right inside of me. Wow. The thing I'm looking for is inside I'm of no me. I'm no longer seeking. No. I have found it. Yeah. I am a finder. Yeah. And it has been found. Correct. And it is inside. Yes. And I can access it with two minute, two twice a day, 15 minute sessions. That's right. You just close your eyes and you're like, oh, dancing with God. Oh, wait, <laughs> forget about seeing the face of God. I am the face of God. And you just remind yourself of that every day, twice a day. And, and that... <laughs> I was like, that might not sound like a big deal, but like, no, it actually sounds like the biggest deal. Um, but it, it's a simple, simple practice. But the way that it changes how you show up with your kids, with your partner, with your coworkers, with your goals, with your money, like it changes everything. It changes everything. Okay. So I have known you for a little bit now. I've heard you talk about meditation many times. I've listened to your podcast a lot. Um, it's one of my favorites. And I, I mean, I think that like, there's something about, I love the content, but I also just like your voice. <laughs> Wait, speaking of my voice, can we just, can we just give people a little disclaimer oh, sure. into what's happening? So my voice is a little extra husky today. Mm -hmm. I just got finished teaching at Summit at Sea, which is an amazing event with 3000 entrepreneurs on a boat. And so it's sort of like being on an airplane for three days. So if you're wondering, like Emily does not sound like herself. That is why. It's extra sexy, Emily. Extra sexy, which Emily. Which I love. So we've been giving your lungs a lot of love. Also, can I just tell them about your care package? Sure. You guys, Kate is the best. I'm in Miami and she and I tell her, I was like, hey, I want to do this, but my voice is a little off. She sends me the sweetest care package, a blanket that you charge in the sun, a nebulizer, garlic and a mason jar, like just so dang thoughtful. It was like a fairy godmother and a witch had a baby and sent a care package. So thank you. You're so welcome. <laughs> we all just need a lot of help. I felt very, very well We need cared to be for. the village that we seek. Yes. Okay. So I have a lot of questions. Let me organize them. I'm going to tell you something first. <laughs> And so that is this. Two Aries giving an interview, <laughs> just going to talk about ourselves. <laughs> Wait, when's your birthday? March 27th. Oh, you were just a couple days after. Okay, happy birthday. Thank happy you. birthday season. Thank you. I 
obviously know about meditation. I also have been listening to you talk about it for a long time. I've been listening to you interview people on your podcast who do your style of meditation. I am a trained yoga teacher. I trained in teaching meditation. Um, I have not been a meditator because I was just like, you know, walking is my meditation. I'm meditating as I do the dishes. I'm, you know, and also who has time for that? So growing up, my mom did TM twice a day, every day, 20 minutes. And so like, also it's very in my realm that people do this, including mothers of young children. So I just like had no reason, but I was like, A, I don't have time for that. B, it's going to be different. It's going to, it's like, I already do that in my own way with all the shit that I do. Right. And then I, to prepare for this interview, I read your book finally, five years later. (laughs) And I was like, Oh, the science is undeniable. And this is not what I am doing when I am washing the dishes. (laughs) what I am doing when I am dancing. And this is not what I am doing. I'm not doing this. I am not doing this. And so I just want to say, what is, I mean, I could tell you, but I want to know from you, like, why does this, why does the Ziva technique or the Z technique as you teach in your book work for people finally after they have trained to be a meditation teacher, grown up with a meditator mother, and like gone decades of learning about this, but never did it. Like somebody like me, why Why is this something that I suddenly was like, oh, I can do that. And it feels great. I've been doing it five days. But like five days is a lot compared to a lifetime of being a no. <laughs> okay, so you're saying what about, yeah, like why, what about why, this why got you it? to do it? Or why is this work better than other things? Well, I mean, I can tell you why I did it is because your book is very convincing. And also you are a walking testament. I just was Say like, everything. if I hadn't met you first, I think I still would have been really compelled. First of all, you're ageless. Your skin is so radiant. Can we talk about my skin for a minute? <laughs> yes. I am. I just turned 45 years old. I have a young child. Yes. I am from Florida. Yeah. So just grew up with sun damage Wait, And galore. you're very fair. I'm very fair. I spent my whole 20s just like blackout drunk. Like there is just no reason right. why my skin should and like look this good. like dancing on Broadway in the middle of the night. Correct. In the middle of the night, sleeping until 11 a.m., like eating French fries at one in the morning. Yeah. Like there's no reason my skin should look this good. No. And it just keeps getting better. And it's so gorgeous and so luminous. So I'm just going to fully out myself and be like, I think I'm going to start meditating so that I can have skin like Emily. No, I literally said to my team yesterday, I was like, you guys, we're going to make an opt-in and it's going to be Emily's top five tips for skincare. And it's going to be like, number five, red light therapy. Number four, vitamin C. I could give you the whole list. But number one, spoiler alert, is Ziva. It should actually just be number one, Ziva. Number two, (laughs) Ziva. Ziva. Number (laughs) three, Ziva. All the rest of that stuff. I mean, I'm sure it is impacted. You also eat really well. Yes. You also, you know. I mean, it is an intense regimen. You're not currently smoking, drinking. Correct. You, like all, no. right. And clearly it's the most important one yes. because I'm doing all the rest of that stuff too. And, and your I skin do, looks amazing. I have great skin. However, like you are a few years older than me and I am looking ahead at like, okay, let's head that direction. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. head this okay. direction. Let's head that direction. I will also say that every birthday I'll do a ceremony, which we can talk about later. Oh yes. And I like say out into the universe, I was like, I just want to keep feeling Hotter and healthier. Yes. And that just Hotter keeps happening. Hotter and healthier. Yeah. 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 And you're very yummy to be around. So that I was just like, okay, I'll have that. So, Great. <laughs> okay. So, so the question is why not, is this method uh, easier, honestly, yeah. and more effective than others? Because there's a lot of different meditation techniques. Yes. Okay. So first of all, just thank you for admitting the fact that you were like, I thought I was meditating when I was doing the dishes. I thought I was meditating when I was doing yoga or dancing or being in the woods. This is my life as a meditation. And people are like, yeah, like running. I'm like, that is called exercise. Cooking is called cooking and exercise is called exercise and meditation is called meditation. That's why they have their own words. They are in fact different things. (laughs) Um, Now, the reason why Ziva works so well is that even though it's a 6,000 year old practice. So the meditation portion of the Ziva technique is based on something called Nishkam Karma Yoga, Mm -hmm. which means union attained by action, hardly taken, lazy meditation. And that thing- By action, hardly 
take it. Yes, effortlessness. And that thing is 6,000 years old. But the Ziva technique, which is mindfulness, meditation, and manifesting, that's new. Like that's the thing that I cognized because I had worked with so many high performers, so many high achievers, so many people like ourselves who have kids and families and companies. And they're like, I don't have time to meditate. And so I knew that I needed to wrap up the practice inside of something that was going to help people achieve their goals. Yes. Right. And so the thing about Ziva is that it's giving your body rest that is five times deeper than sleep. And this is a really important point because when you give your body the rest that it needs, it knows how to heal itself. Yes. And then it's not just healing from the stress from today, which is what people think meditation is. Yes. Like, oh, I had a stressful day. Let me go and do some breath work or let me go and visualize something, which is fine. Yeah. That creates a state change. But Ziva is creating a trait change. It is actually healing you on a cellular level because that deep rest is de-exciting your nervous system. And when you de-excite something, you create order. And when you create order inside of your body, that lifetime of stress that we've all been accumulating can start to come up yeah. and out. So I think that's why we love each other so much and why our work is so complimentary because you're teaching people to regulate their nervous systems in relationship to money. I'm teaching, I'm giving people the most powerful nervous system regulation tool that I've ever found. And I've been studying this stuff for 20 something years. Yeah. But I always say, if I find something more powerful, I'll start teaching that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I think I had a misunderstanding and I'm, I'm really curious because there there are places, multiple places that I have heard the following, which is that if someone is, um, like there are times where meditation can be contraindicated if someone is in a dysregulated nervous system state. What are your thoughts? What are those times? Well, <laughs> like yes. If, because there are times when we are dysregulated on the end of a fight or flight response. And again, like I'm not the world's leading expert here. So I'm genuinely interested in your, the way I interview is not like, let me challenge you just so you know. Kate Northrop with the cutting hard like, questions. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm just gen I'm genuinely curious. And so like when we are in a hyper nervous system response, we're out of our range of regulation. We're in a hyper. So fight, flight, uh, that actually what we May, so for somebody in a more extreme case, we need something that actually allows us to move and complete the direction that we are going and that like sitting still mm -hmm. actually would not be the first place to start when we're in that that actual moment of like, I'm in fight flight. Yeah. Like if, if you're getting attacked by a tiger, do not stop, drop and meditate. Like it is appropriate. But what if you, your body thinks you're getting attacked by a tiger and then you're you, not? Then you should meditate. Okay. Because the, the reality is that we are rarely under a predatory attack. Yeah. And yet our bodies are responding as if they are under a predatory attack. And that is why stress is so toxic. That yeah. is why stress is so damaging and prematurely aging us. So I hear what you're saying yeah. about like, sometimes we need to complete the stress reaction. Yes. And, and, but the, the completion of it at the end is going back to regulation. Yes, of course. So it's like, yes, feel it, feel it fully, but then you do want to regulate. And I think meditation would be an amazing tool to regulate. The yes. only times I recommend that people do not meditate is if they have had, like, I will suggest people do not take Ziva if they've had a very recent, very intense trauma and they have suicidality, they're yeah. having suicidality thoughts. If they are suffering from like extreme split personality, okay. um, then I will usually suggest therapy to start and I will suggest mindfulness to start. Yes. Which let's just maybe hit on yeah, that. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. yeah. So, so what are the, so you, you teach these three M's mm -hmm. and I think many people conflate mindfulness with meditation. Yeah. What's the difference and what's the third M? Yeah. So mindfulness, meditation, and manifesting, those are the three M's that make up the Ziva technique. Mm -hmm. And I have found that all three together are so much more powerful than any of them alone. I think that quite frankly, that's why I wanted to try this oh. because I like stimulus and just meditation sounds boring. <laughs> so what was it? The mindfulness part that feels stimulating or the, or the manifesting part feels Both. stimulating. It just yeah. felt more fun because there are three things, not one. <laughs> I love it. I Such love a it. Seven Enneagram. Oh my more gosh. More is more. <laughs> That's why I'm so proud of you for saying no right now. Together. So mindfulness is what most people are calling meditation yes. right now. So most of the free apps on your phone, most of the guided videos on YouTube, they are teaching what I would call mindfulness. So anytime you're 
if someone's guiding you through something, anytime you are focusing your awareness, I would put that in the category of mindfulness, which is very different from the meditation portion of Ziva, which is where we are giving our body rest that's five times deeper than sleep. And you're actually moving beyond the realm of thinking into the realm of pure being, into the realm of pure consciousness, into pure source. Mm. And so, you know, like Joe, Joe Dispenza would teach this is like you're, you're accessing that source energy or the, um, field of limitless possibility, the you know, the quantum field. So I can drop people into that within 30 to 45 seconds. It doesn't have to take 45 minutes of someone yelling at you. You can actually just like close your eyes and Ideally like not. drop right into it. Anytime. Okay. So the other thing that has been really powerful, yeah. and I'm going to come back to how they all three work together is like that dropping in whenever you want. Like this morning I meditated while both of my kids were in the bedroom, just like, I don't know what they were doing. And, uh, that was great because this idea that it has to be like quiet and I have to have specific props and I had to, but then it just like makes it so easy to be like, well, I can't do that. Totally. It's like, you know, I trick myself into working out cause I have a free app <laughs> called the seven minute workout and I just, and there's, it requires no equipment and it's seven minutes. Yeah. And so as long as I can get a sports bra on my body, I have no excuse to not do it. And I feel like the same is true of Ziva. It's like, it doesn't require equipment. You don't have to be able to clear your mind. You can do it literally anywhere. There can be noise happening. Your kids can be in the next room. You can do it at the office. It takes 15 minutes and your entire life will get better. Yeah. Like, so it's like, it, it's really yes. hard to argue against it. Okay. So the mindfulness back to the apps were that's not meditation. It is what? what I would call mindfulness. So I would define mindfulness as the art of bringing your awareness into the present moment, mm -hmm. which is beautiful mm -hmm. and profound. And, and guess what? The present moment is where our bliss and fulfillment live. So like it, there's a big game there coming back to now, back to now, especially in where we're all addicted to our phones. However, this is very different from the meditation portion of Ziva where you are accessing a verifiable fourth state of consciousness. Yeah. So different than waking, different than sleeping and different from dreaming. And it's in that fourth state of consciousness that you're giving your body that deep rest. And so there we go back to the de excitation. And one thing that I think is very cool is that you're not just healing the stress from your body and your life. You can actually start to unwind the stuff that you've inherited for at least two generations. Some people hypothesize as many as seven. Well, the way that our DNA overlaps and the fact that our eggs existed when our mother, that like the egg that created each of us existed when our mother was a fetus in our grandmother's womb at the age of four months gestation. I think it would be really hard to even say where that exactly would end because there really is no end or no beginning to a specific human life. Yes. So Amen. I think it goes beyond two generations. I'm just yeah, but, hypothesizing. No, I, but, you, but you're, what you're suggesting though, is that it would be very hard to even argue that, that two generations back wouldn't, would not be impacted. It's infinite. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So great. What happens with the third M? Okay. So at the end of the Ziva practice, so you spend like one minute in mindfulness, you do about 14 ish minutes with the meditation. And then the last two minutes we practice manifesting and manifesting is my jam. I know it's your jam too. And so what is manifesting? I would define manifesting as consciously creating a life you love. It's you getting intentional about how you want your life to look. And when people are like, Oh, that sounds too woo woo, or that's too hippy dippy. I'm like, here's the reality. We are all manifesting all the time. Your yeah. thoughts do become things. It's just, are you aware of it or not? Are you being intentional about it? It's like, are you doing your quarterly goals like you would at a company? Yeah. Are you setting your annual goals like you would at a company? You wanna do that with your life as well. So the magic of manifesting at the end of Ziva is that you've just flooded your brain and body with dopamine and serotonin, which are bliss chemicals. So you've done, here, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you the world's simplest manifestation formula. Ready? Mm -hmm. Feel good, place the order, place the order, feel good. Feel good, place the order, place the order, feel good, feel good, place the order, place the order, feel good. And that's kind of it. it. I mean, that's a simple formula to understand. It's much more intense to practice because it's not about putting a happy face sticker on an empty tank of gas. It is about doing whatever the F it takes to sustainably and reliably feel, feel good. good yeah. And one of those things is meditation. And the thing about meditation is that it's not just going to make you feel better when your eyes are closed. It's not an escapism. It's not because if you want to just feel good when your eyes are closed, you could go get high or you could take drugs or something. 
But this is about, yes, you're going to release that dopamine and serotonin when your eyes are closed, but then that, that's going to stay with you yeah. throughout the rest of the day. And it's going to increase your baseline level of bliss so that not only the manifestations that happen when you're in the sitting, but the state of consciousness with which you are viewing the entirety of the rest of your life changes. So what we do in the manifesting portion is at the end, I have people ask the question that's very simple. What would I love? What would I love right now? And love puts you into spirit. It puts you into possibility. Mm. What would I love right now? It puts you into presence. And when you ask that question from that space of having accessed source energy, from that space of flooding your brain and body with dopamine and serotonin, it becomes this two-way conversation. It's not just you complaining to God, right? Which is like what most people do when they pray. They're like, can, this person's sick. Can you fix that? And or this. even placing the order from ego. Or fear. Yeah. Or lack. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I, can I please have some more money? Can I please find a boyfriend? Because I'm almost 30 and I don't know if I'm ever going to find one. And like that, that neediness is like not it, you know? But if you're, if you're coming to your prayers from a place of, I already have everything yeah. that I need. Thank you so much for everything you've already given me. Gratitude is simply acknowledging everything you've already manifested. It's acknowledging everything that nature has already co-created mm -hmm. with you. And then from that place of fulfillment to ask the question, what would I love you can get curious and actually listen to the answer and it might surprise you. Yeah. Yeah. How did you find meditation? So I was on Broadway doing a chorus line. I was understudying three of the lead roles, which means you show up to the theater and you have no what? idea which character you're going to play. Singular sensation. I know I can tell you these stories because you're a Broadway nerd like me, but I was hired really to play Sheila. I was hired because mm -hmm. I was an amazing Sheila. I bet you were. But I went on all the time for Val and oh. Val's the tits and ass girl. Yeah. And I was horrible. Like you'd be a great Val. Oh, thanks. Yes. I was not a good Val. And so, and yet the girl that played Val called out sick all the time. So I was getting thrown on at a moment's notice for oh. a role that I was terrible at. Oh, jeez. And like the first time I ever went on was the first time they ever gave comp tickets to the Broadway community. So it was just filled with judgy gaze. And I was like, oh no, oh no. Like they were like, this is not Val. She is not good. She cannot hit that note. She is not doing good. And I was like, this is my worst nightmare coming true. And I like didn't, and I already had insomnia. And then that happened and my insomnia got worse. And so like, here I am on Broadway doing the thing I wanted to do since I was a child. And this is why I was miserable. I was going gray. I was getting sick. I and was, you were I, what, like 29? I was 26, 27. 26 yeah, going gay. You're going. <laughs> well, <laughs> we can talk about that later. when you went gay. <laughs> I guess about 18. Okay, great. So we'll circle back. <laughs> You're 26, getting gray hair, insomniac, freaking out. Yeah. And, then, <laughs> and how did you find meditation? <laughs> oh God! <sighs> the thing that makes this <laughs> so much harder is how much I'm trying to not cough when I'm laughing. It's hard. Okay. okay, so we can do another whole podcast about my spectrum of gayness. That'd be great. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> but on this, I was in my twenties, having insomnia, going gray sucking at my job, knowing that I'm sucking at my job. And all I want to do is be good at my job. Like all I want to do is be the best Broadway performer. And so thankfully this amazing woman was sitting next to me in the dressing room. Her name was Dion. And she was understanding five of the leads, including Cassie and crushing it. I mean, every song she sang, every dance she danced, every bite of food this woman ate, she'd be like, oh, this is sensational. And she was Australian. Amazing. Meditation does not give you a bad Australian accent. And I was like, girl, what do you know that I don't know? And she said, I meditate. 
to which I like gave the world's biggest Clear. eye roll. Yeah, absolutely. I was like, you don't understand. My stress is special. Ain't nobody got time for that. Like I have real problems. Did you see what just happened on that stage yesterday? And um, so anyway, she's finally, she's like, look, my teacher's in town. And I was like, look, I got to try something. And so I went along to this course. First day of the first course, I was in a different state of consciousness than I had ever been in before. And I liked it. And then that night I slept through the night for the first time in 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I have every night since. And that was 16 years ago. Then I stopped getting sick. I didn't get sick for eight and a half years until, you know, maybe this boat ride this weekend. Um, it's like a cosmic clearing. It's yeah, different. cosmic clearing. I started enjoying my job again. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why isn't everyone doing this? Like, it's not just the name of my podcast. Like, I am genuinely that girl that when I find something that works, I'm like, why isn't everyone doing this? Yeah. So I left Broadway. I went to India. I started what became a three-year training process to teach. So just so that people have some context for this, it's not like a weekend certification. It was thousands of hours of meditation, thousands of hours of apprenticing, hundreds of hours of transcribing books by hand in Sanskrit, and, and about 18 hours a week of this industrial strength meditation for a year. I was meditating 18 hours a week for a year. Wow. Which basically like any, any old story you had lodged in your nervous system starts to come up and out. Wow. Like I went fully insane, but then I think that's the thing that forges you into the type of person that has a nervous system that people want to learn to meditate from. Totally. Yeah. And then you had the gall to teach it online. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is a great story. <laughs> yeah. Please tell. So I was in a very beautiful community. I was sort of like becoming the rising star of the community. Like I would go on retreats. In and, your meditation community. In my meditation community, yes. That was ba uh, based in the lineage in India. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. It, it, okay. I mean, they were all over the world. And this but, teacher you mm -hmm. went to with Dion, the Australian. Uh-huh also was from this particular lineage as, yes. as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. so the the was, one that you said, can you say the Sanskrit word again? The Nishkam, Nishkam Karma Yoga. Nishkam Karma yeah. Yoga. Yeah. So I learned from a person in New York City and then ended up going to LA and ended up in Rishikesh, India. So I had this beautiful like global network of meditators from all over the world. And I was quickly becoming like, you know, well-known as a teacher mm -hmm. and I love teaching and I was using all of my theatricality to make the courses really entertaining. Totally. And then- Meditation, but make it Broadway. Yes, make meditation. But I was like, it doesn't have to be so effing boring, totally. everybody. Like meditation is boring enough. We can at least make learning about it fun. Mm -hmm. I remember I would go on these retreats and people would ask the teacher questions and he would be like, Emily, what do you think? Mm -hmm. Emily, what do you think? What do you think? Because my business was going very well. And and then I did, I had the gall and the audacity to make the world's first online meditation training. Which what I'm, year was that? 2013. Okay. May 13th, 2013. Ooh. So it was actually just weeks before Headspace came out, weeks before the first Oprah Chopra challenge. So it's weird to think now, like wow. anyone under 40 doesn't remember a time that meditation wasn't was or it, it was weird. And so they also can't remember that like online courses weren't a thing. So online courses were weird. Meditation was weird. And so I was known as what people would call like a nudist Buddhist in the <laughs> business communities. But like you can be like one flavor of weird, but you can't be two flavors of weird. So it's like, you could be nudist or you could be a Buddhist, but you can't be a nudist Buddhist. <laughs> and I was both. So I launched this course. I put every penny I had in it. It cost me like $20,000 to shoot it and edit it. And I like cobbled together the back end with like chewing gum and floss. Uh -huh. And you know, like it was not plug and play like I it is now. I do know. And for six weeks, I was like leading up to it. And we did our first sales call and two people purchased. And the thing cost $199. So I had spent $20,000 building an online course that I made $400 on the first launch. And I was like, oh no, I've made a horrible mistake. And big shout out to my ex-husband uh, who was like, you're not wrong, you're just early. You're just early. You're just early. Like, trust yourself. Trust this. You're just early. Beautiful. And it was like one of the best pieces of advice that I got. Cause I mean, who knew? Like, who knew that online courses and meditation were going to become, you know, so ubiquitous, so everywhere. And so I'm glad I stayed the course. Yeah. Um, but when I made that, I got kicked out of my meditation community. Like they were mad at me because I had, I don't actually know why they were mad at me. I don't yeah, think any of really... them actually took the course because I took great care in making sure that I wasn't taking the things that are protected in the lineage, yeah. taking yeah. the inner workings of the things that are yeah. not meant to be transmitted online. Well, even in your book, you do that. Yeah. Like, like I, I, the, the book is like a, is like the, the Vespa. Yeah. Ziva <laughs> online is the Toyota mm -hmm. and Ziva live is the Tesla. Yeah. Right. And they're all, they all serve different purposes. Mm -hmm. They're all going to get you where you're going. For they're sure. all going to reduce your stress. They're all going to increase your consciousness, mm -hmm. but they're varying like, like levels of power. Yeah. 
And, um, and by power, I mean like how much unstressing is it going yeah. to create in the body? So anyway, I got kicked out of the community, which in hindsight taught me how to fly. Yeah. Like I needed that nest and I needed to get kicked out of that nest. Wow. Um, just for curiosity's sake, like, have you ever been in touch with anybody from that community again? Yeah. 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 I Came still have some around. really dear friends yeah. from there. Yeah. And then. Back to when I turned gay. Yeah. <laughs> You're coming, we're coming back because even if you had spent your entire career beating the drum of meditation, you would be changing millions and millions of lives. Um, but you are iterative. You are a hungry bitch. <laughs> you are appetitious, right? You want, and that's beautiful. And I only recognize it because I am that too. And so there's been more there's been even more. And one of the stories that you have told on your podcast is when you discovered the combination of bringing then our life force energy in with manifestation. How did that come about? When were you introduced to, and maybe it has something to do with your birthday ritual. Yes, mm -hmm. it does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so yeah, about three years ago, I had a big life change. I don't know if anyone has noticed, but 2020 was kind of a big year for the species. <laughs> maybe maybe someone listening had that same experience. Yeah. But I I had one very amazing life, and then everything just you know changed. I have this one video on my Instagram of my son taking my vision board from 2020 and just ripping it all off. And it was just like, that is the most apropos video I've ever seen. He was like one year old. Like he wasn't doing it maliciously. He was no, just he like- he was just ripping paper because yeah, that's what babies do. Yeah, like we got we got new plants. Um, <laughs> so basically what, what I discovered was this way to practice embodied manifesting. And so it's sort of like the next part of the Ziva technique. So there's mindfulness, meditation, and manifesting. But the way that I had been teaching manifesting was from the neck up. Yeah. And that works. Thoughts become things. What we put our attention on grows. It's true. I just found a way to supercharge it. If you start to get your head, your heart, and your hoo-ha all pointed towards your dreams. Mm -hmm. And so good news about a hoo-ha, everybody has one. And it includes both your anatomy and the energy center around your anatomy. So just like when we say heart, we don't just mean the organ right. beating the blood. We mean also the electromagnetic field around it that is 5,000 times more powerful than our heads. So anyone who's ever manifested anything, if you've been doing that with your thoughts, be like, okay, cool. Now imagine you could supercharge that times 5,000. That's what happens when you start manifesting with your heart. Now imagine that you could plug the generator and the magnet of your body up to that same dream. Your creative center. Yeah, your creative life force, the thing that is like the generator and magnet of your body. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've been doing with something called Sacred Secret. So that's this new body of work. And here's the real spoiler alert. The secret is that we're all God pretending to be human. <laughs> That's like the real esoteric like lens out is that we're all divine masquerading as human. But the formula is visualize, alchemize, magnetize. So we visualize something we want to manifest. We alchemize anything standing in the way. And then we magnetize it with this life force energy or what I call creation energy. Mm -hmm. So what is creation energy? It is the life force inside of us, the thing that it could, yes, make a baby, but it could also write a book or it could start a company. Like you can do whatever you want with it. Yeah. It's just pure creation energy. It's just a matter of like, where do we want to point that? So 2020 happened. I asked for a divorce. Three weeks later, I met my now love, Adam, and my best friend, Layla. On the same night, right? On the same night. And I also did a very really profound delivers. medicine ceremony mm -hmm. all in one day. Mm -hmm. And it was like, boop, timeline shift. Mm -hmm. New, new, we got a new pair of shoes and then <laughs> we got a new pair of cosmic shoes. And then nature started like fire hosing me with this PhD in sacred sexuality. And I was like, Thank and that you. was not really, you did write about, um, you know, there's a chapter in your book called Om to o OMG. Yes. Um, and so you did talk about sexual energy a little bit. Yes. But that wasn't a world you were in before. Yes. Correct. Sacred sexuality really at all or like well, pinky toe? It's interesting because I now live with Regina Tomashow, a.k.a. Mama Gina. Yeah. And she's always like, girl, why is your pussy so turned on? Like, she's always like, why are you so activated? And I think it's- Like, you don't present as a woman who started this kind of thing three years ago. Right. Like, she's like a, she doesn't understand, like, why I am as embodied as I am. Mm -hmm. But I think 
it's from Broadway. Like I've been singing and dancing and acting since I was eight. I've been using my body yeah. as an instrument yeah. since I was eight. I have been alchemizing emotions through acting or yeah. singing or dance since I was eight. So there was already like a deep level of embodiment that I actually think that just teaching meditation and just sitting down and talking about neuroscience was not big enough to hold all of me. Like that was not a big enough yeah. container to hold my performer, my peacock, my right. dancer, because my Because it singer. is missing a whole, a, the, the vast majority of us. What do you mean? Uh, just our head is missing the ma vast majority of us. If we're only in like head up, which I yes. understand, like you're talking about the nervous system, which is going through our entire body. So you've always yes. been talking about the entire body. Yes. But it is like, and I think like in our culture- that's the opportunity we have is to bring in all of us. Yes. And I think that's why, you know what? Here's why I was ready to start meditating because I know you and I know it's not only head up. So I think, I, cause honestly, meditation to me has always been like, I'm like, I'm not going to fix things with my head is not where I go. Yes. But because I know you and I know, like I have felt your embodiment and how you bring the whole thing, it felt like safe and it felt like, oh, this is a technique that has space for all of me. Ooh, I would argue that the technique has nothing but space that. and that it's not using right. the head at all because the yeah. whole deal is that you're moving beyond the realm of thinking right. into the realm of being. Exactly. You are Which transcending even, the mind. And transcending the, the body. Yes. Really. Yeah. Like I am not Emily Fletcher when right. I am in the meditation. I just right. am. You just yeah. yeah. And then, and then when you, and that lets you in on the sacred secret as well, because it's like the little wave of individuality de-excites to remind itself that it is the ocean of totality. And then when you come back into that meditation, the wave is no longer under the illusion that it is just the wave. It knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is also the mm -hmm. ocean. And that's one of the reasons why I love this style of meditation and this lineage so much is that it's constantly celebrating the duality. It is celebrating individuality and totality. Mm -hmm. It is celebrating human and divine. It's not saying this human life is just an illusion. Just put your attention on God. Right. It's like both and. Yeah, both and because I have also sat in rooms with folks who are like, this is just a meat suit. And first of all, I don't like that phrase. Me neither. Um, it makes me want to vomit. <laughs> Second of all, I'm like, actually my experience living in a human body is incredibly trans, like it, divine. I don't even want to use the word transcendent. Yeah, divine. Transcendent means we are moving up and out. And yes. my greatest moments of awe and of I don't know, like the fullness of being have been deeply in my body. Yes. Amen. Yeah. And I think that's why Ziva, like the meditation and sacred secret are just beautiful, are such beautiful mm -hmm. compliments for each other because the meditation is about transcendence. It is about connecting to that everythingness. But sacred secret is all about being so deeply in your body, about bringing the divinity in, no, the divinity is already in the body. Yep. It's just about remembering it and savoring exactly. it. Exactly. And maybe even turning up the dial to yes. feel more of it. Yes. Do you think that in order to practice sacred secret, you need to have on board a meditation practice? I don't think it's necessary. I think it certainly helps. Okay, great. Like I, and I, I've struggled with this quite a bit. I'm like, do I want to have people do Ziva online <laughs> totally. before they yeah. do is sacred it a prerequisite? secret? Right. Is it a prerequisite? And I think just for all reasons, no. Um, however, I know that there are some like Tantra teachers that are like, I won't even teach Tantra unless you've done meditation for 10 years. Totally. And I think that's why when I started getting introduced to these practices, they took like wildfire is because I had yeah. such fertile soil. Right. I had been meditating for 16 years. So you planted those seeds and it was like, woo. I had these massive activations. I took to it really quickly because my nervous system was very supple. It was like, it wasn't like rigid from lifetime of stress. Exactly. Yeah. And so when you say fertile soil, I want to highlight, because that's an analogy I use a lot. Mm. Our soil really, to me, our soil is our body. Yeah. And at the core, core, core of it, it is the architecture or the, the key uh, communication system of our body, which is our nervous system. And so what we plant in that soil is dependent on the health of the soil. And, yes. and you had this incredibly healthy, 
fertile soil, like yes. ready to go because it wasn't running trauma loops. Yes, totally. You know? So that said, I do think it's helpful before you start Sacred Secret to have a meditation practice. However, what has blown my mind again and again and again is how powerful the pleasure is because that's what Sacred Secret is. So ultimately, we're using like our pleasure to pray. I've been amazed at how potent that pleasure is at alchemizing trauma. Yes. So that's the other thing. What what is some of the the data you know, either anecdotal or actual research yep. around pleasure and the nervous system? Yeah. Well, I'll share I'll share a few data pieces and then I'll share anecdotal. One is that if you are orgasming three times or more a week, you look 10 years younger. Three orgasms a week looking 10 years That's younger. That's a great prescription. That is a great prescription. Also, like orgasm is like this moment of, in French, what do they call it? The petite mort. It's the little death, right? So you're practicing dying, which is also what we do in meditation. We are practicing dying. Shivasana means corpse pose, right? So we're practicing dying. And it's also, you know, we're starting to incorporate medicine as well at Ziva. And that, so our new mission statement is that we want to help people turn up the dial on their divinity through meditation, pleasure, and medicine so that we can solve the big challenges that we're facing as a species and have a great time doing it. But what medicine, pleasure, and meditation all have in common is that they're all ways of practicing dying, which really that sounds scary, but it just means like knowing that this body, this identity, this personality is not all that there is, that there's a whole vast universe that we can dance with as well. So anecdotally, what I've seen on these retreats, so I do online retreats, in-person retreats, and I've seen people where I was like, certainly that person is about to leave. They're about to go get on an airplane and leave this retreat. Like they are so triggered. They are so like in their stuff. And most of the people who come to me are brand new. They've not done any, um, any Tantra, any breath work, any medicine ceremonies. They just show up and they're like, okay, there's something in my transmission that just allows people to trust me, which I take very, very seriously. It's yeah, amazing. Um, what a gift. It is. And so I can take people from brand new to very, very deep, provided that we go slow and make sure yeah, that their intellect understands it. But then they'll do one like emotional alchemy session and then they're shining brighter than I've ever seen before. Like on every single breath work, we have people be like, I, I rebirthed myself. I birthed my unborn daughter. I birthed a daughter that I miscarried. So there's this like deep birthing process that always happens. I also, this is a guy I'm going to see tonight. He's coming to my event tonight. 47 year old, straight, white, male, cisgendered man, firefighter from Miami. Oh, I heard you talk about him. Yeah. I just think I can't stop telling the story. So we, we're on the sacred secret retreat. We do this exercise. Afterwards, he sits up and he's like, well, I found my energetic pussy and I liked it. I also felt what it was like to gestate my unborn daughter. And I was like, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is what the crumbling of the patriarchy looks like. It has nothing to do with destroying anything. It has to do with giving everyone a visceral experience of the profundity of the divine feminine. And if we all could taste that and feel that, we wouldn't be trying to eradicate it from the planet. We would be wanting to proliferate it on the planet. More, please. More. Do you practice... Also, can I say the B word on this? I should maybe ask. Yeah, okay, you great. can say anything. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I showed up at Regina's doorstep when I was 22. Like, yeah. God bless. Plus we just, and I just like, are good friends. Shout out to Regina Thomas Shower and Layla Martin. Like they've been just such dear friends and amazing teachers. Yeah. 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 So do you practice sacred secret and meditation every day? I meditate every day, twice a day, like non-negotiable for 16 years, except for when I had my son for about a month postpartum. I didn't meditate one time. Really? Not one time. I was in, well, I had a very liberating. To okay. Hear. I'm glad. Yeah. That's yeah. helpful. I think not once I was in the real shitter. I had a really oh, tough postpartum. So sorry. Thanks. It's it was so hard, but you know what? I was like, you know what? I have put deposits in my bank account. Well, so that's the thing, right? Because yeah. how many years before that had you been meditating twice a day? Like 11. Exactly. Yeah. So I've been it's depositing in the bank account so that I could withdraw. Yeah. Okay. So long story short, I do meditate twice a day, every day. However, I do not practice sacred secret every day. 
I feel like I'm constantly sourcing my life force energy. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly playing the game of feel good, place the order. But as far as like the actual formula of yeah. visualize, alchemize, magnetize, I like to do that a bit more ceremonially. Love it. So if there's something big I want to manifest, I'll have, I'll do a ceremony with myself. Sometimes my partner and I will do a ceremony where we'll say out loud something that we want to manifest. He'll say his dream, I'll say mine, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's the same thing. And then we'll do a ceremony together. And also like once people learn it, like the minimum viable dose is basically any time you're yeah. in an ecstatic state, any time you're in an orgasmic state, you can think about your dreams. Mm -hmm. And I really love this idea of using our pleasure to pray. Like it's so, it's like the perfect kind of blasphemous because the exact thing that we've been told is a sin or wrong or that we're going to go to hell for, I think is the most holy, divine, yeah. sacred thing that there is. Which is this, why we were told that's it right. was wrong. That's right. And so to reclaim that pleasure for mm -hmm. ourselves and then to use it to dedicate to our dreams has been one of the most profound, sacred, holy initiations of my entire mm -hmm. life. Do you ever actively bring your attention to your hoo-ha while you're doing the third M in your meditation practice? In your So after the mindfulness meditation and then manifesting? Great question. Do you it's bring starting, online that part of your body? It's starting to happen organically okay, now. Okay, yeah, I bet. Like now after I meditate, like I feel like this surge of pleasure happening in my body. And so cool. I think my body's starting to link together my manifestations and pleasure, which is great. So... I just am remembering right now that what's been happening to me as I do the third M. Uh, so this thing started happening to me in my uh, mid 20s ish, 26, 27, where um, when I have an orgasm, sometimes I shake and it's this uncontrollable, not in a bad way, like deep. Uh, contraction in like the deep, deep part of my belly. So my friend, Megan Watterson explained to me about Kundalini rising and we did a whole meditation about it and it was a whole thing. So she explained what was going on and that has happened ever since then. Um, it feels similar to giving birth, honestly, but it does, it's, uh, more pleasurable in my experience of giving birth. And <laughs> And then it also has happened the times that I've done psilocybin, which is really interesting. And then anytime I think about it, it will also happen. And other times too, uh, just at other times. But it's been happening spontaneously during the third M, which I think is really interesting. What do you think about that? Yes. Yeah, so I taught someone, this was very early on in my meditation career, and I, we did a whole puja ceremony. I gave her her mantra and then everyone was meditating and then someone left. And I was like, uh-oh, that's not good. Like, why is she leaving? And then I went, and finally I went to check on her and she was in the bathroom and I was like, are you okay? And she's like, I don't know. And then afterwards I was like, let's, let's talk, let's chat. And what was happening is that this, there was a lot of Kundalini energy that was waking up in her right out of the gate. And sometimes when you meditate, what's happening is because you're bringing the whole body into order. Mm -hmm. You're, you're sort of like unblocking the whole Shashunya, the whole like chakra yeah. lines. Um, the energy will start to move. Mm -hmm. And what happened for her is that she, she actually started having spontaneous orgasms mm -hmm. every time she meditated. That's fun. Which, well, it sounds fun. It's a lot though. Unless you're like, this is a non-consensual orgasm. Like it totally, it, yeah. it, like you really want to choose that, Absolutely. you know, you want to choose when you want to choose where. <laughs> and so then what happens, we, we unblocked her sacral chakra mm -hmm. and then the energy could start to flow. Cool. And all then the she started up. having like spontaneous mudras and having all these exciting mm -hmm. things were happening. So the thing is that usually the energy starts at the root. It starts yeah. at the base. And so we want it to flow. We want to be able to send that energy anywhere we want. Oh, yeah. We want to bring it up to our solar plexus for confidence. We want to bring it up to our brains to fuel our visions. We want to bring it up to our heart to fuel our love. But ultimately, like we want to be the ones driving the ship. Like, where do I want this energy to, to be manifest? Yeah. Okay. Speaking of manifestation. Mm-hmm. So you have a really different take on manifestation and you've just explained it, which is feel good, place the order, place the order, feel good, which I absolutely love. I am so on board. And you said in your book that when we say at the end, uh, in the, in the third M in the manifestation portion, what would I really love? Which I don't know if you said that in this book. So I'm really excited to have that other piece of information because I am a non-specific manifester and I get a little tripped up. I with am, the like visualizing a thing happening. By the way, thank you so much. I think you, our group, like our mastermind group introduced yes, this concept talk, yeah. to me. Cause I am this also a human a non, design thing. I'm also a non-specific manifester. Yeah. So I struggle with like, 
visualizing a specific thing I want to have happen. And it actually makes me feel a little constricted. Yep. And so you shared that, uh, the instructions were, uh, receiving at that time are not a plan that we are delivering, but they're actually like a manual. So we're actually, um, that, that when we are getting in touch with our desires, they're not like a ego-based, identity-based, personality-based plan, but they're actually sort of like our divine instruction manual that we're yes. receiving. Yes. And so that piece that you just added around, like, what would I love when we're in that really regulated, beautiful bliss field space is so, so great. And I'm curious for you, like, I know you have stuff you want, you have goals, so do I, but like, I feel all like, around like visualizing them specifically, I can get a little, so if, (laughs) so like, I don't know, what do you think? Should we be like visualizing a specific thing or should I just get into the mode of I'm going to, in this moment, feel as good as possible and just trust that what is meant for me is just going to come. So this is a very nuanced question yes. because it <laughs> certainly depends on the person. It depends on where they are in their manifestation career. It depends on if they are what, they, what I would call active or receptive manifestors. Mm-hmm. It also depends on the goal. Yeah. Right. Like if you're manifesting a person, like a partner, likely what you want to put your attention on is how that relationship feels, how you feel in their presence, how they feel to you versus like, well, I like the way his stubble feels on my skin or, you know, I mean, like certainly those details, here's what I say. The details matter only to the degree to which they make you feel good. So if the details make you feel good, then great. Feel the stubble on your skin. Mm -hmm. Picture that peacock blue on the wall of your new home. You know, feel the leather on the steering wheel of Mm -hmm. the car. If the details turn you on, if the details stress you out, then don't do it. Go into the feeling. And what I want people to know is that you don't have to have a specific, like, you know, point by point plan in order to manifest. It can be as simple as I'm manifesting freedom. Mm. I'm manifesting generosity. I'm manifesting the feeling of possibility. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Super, super helpful. Mm -hmm. So if someone is listening to this conversation and they are like, I have been reading your book and finally ready. Finally like, yes, I clearly have time for 15 minutes a day, twice a day. If it is going to make every single part of my life better, how could I possibly not have time for that? Where should they start to learn this incredible practice? Yeah. So I think that the the book is really good at the why we meditate. It's a great like science, the science of sex, how it's going to reverse your body it's age, so good. improve your sleep. Thank you so I much. I love the science so much. I love this book so much. I am so it's really honored. great. It really. And also fun to read. Yeah. Thank but you. But smart. Because sometimes thank books you. that are fun aren't that smart. Well, I think so I have am, both. I am both of those things. You are. And so I appreciate that that translated in the book. Um, but the book is really like the why and the science. But where Ziva Online, which is, you know, the remember I said I made the world's first online yep. meditation training. So that was back in 2013. So I've had 11 years to refine this puppy, right? And also create like the minimum viable dose. Like I'm not looking for people to do this. I don't need, they don't need to spend their whole days meditating. It's like, no, we meditate to get good at life not to get good at meditation. So it's just 15 minutes a day for 15 days. And that's our most popular, our most effective meditation training. It's called Ziva Online. And the first three days teach the mindfulness. It's also a lot of the neuroscience. And then days four through 12 teach you the meditation. And the thing I want people to understand, we touched on it a little bit, but this is likely not like any other meditation they've tried. It feels more like a nap sitting up than it does like, I have to clear my mind or I have to sit totally still. It's like, it's not a monk practice. It is a practice for people like us. It is a practice for people with busy minds and busy lives. So you don't have to clear your mind. And then days 13, 14, and 15, we teach the manifesting. And it doesn't matter if you're specific or non-specific, it doesn't matter if you know what your dreams or not. It's just time to take two minutes from this place of feeling good to place the order. And again, I've found that all three M's together are so much more powerful than any one alone. So I'd love to gift your folks um, a free masterclass. If they want to go to zivameditation.com slash podcast, there is a free masterclass there that goes into some of the science that we cover in the book. And then there's a beautiful invitation to join Ziva online in there. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Okay. And 
I, I want to share that if you also want more Emily, which I can't imagine you wouldn't, you really need to listen to her podcast, Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? I've listened to 80% at least of the episodes you've put out. I might be your biggest fan. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure somebody's listened to all of them, but I'm like catching up. I just, beyond loving your voice, which is great, um, the way you interview people, your enthusiasm, the depth of what you bring, and for anyone else who is someone who is voracious for information that's maybe more in the nooks and crannies of our culture, um, I love your podcast so mm. much. So so everybody listen to Why Isn't Everyone Doing This, um, which you can find on any podcast platform. And is there anywhere else that people should connect with you? I'd say zivameditation.com. So Z-I-V-A meditation.com has all of these resources. So Sacred Secret, Ziva Meditation, the book, the podcast, all of that can be found there. And we're on social media. We just hit 150,000 followers, which felt like a big milestone. Yeah. And it's just at Z-I-V-A meditation. Amazing. I love you, Emily. This I could do this so fun. all day. This you so make fun. me laugh. I love you. I also, le I listened to you all night last night. I was like listening to you preparing for today and I was just listening to your podcast in my ears so I love that. and you're just so special. And thank you for your joy, for your wisdom, for your love, for your caretaking. There's no one like you. Thanks, Emily. I love you.